This is the call of the March 16th meeting of the Wilmette Public Library Board of Trustees meeting to order. All notices have been given and Director Austin is filling the requirement of hosting it from the Wilmette Public Library. Can we have the roll call and call the meeting to order? Sure. Trustee Barshis. Mm -hmm. Trustee Barshis here. Trustee Fishman. Here. Trustee Johnson. Here. Trustee Riddle. Not. Okay. Uh, Trustee Rogers. Here. Trustee Wolf. Here. And Trustee McDonald. Here. And then the staff that are present, we have Stephen. And yeah, so we've got a we got a few staff on the call okay. here. So uh -huh. um, myself, Anthony Austin, we've got Stephen Coble, I see Kim Hegland, and Gail Justman, Marty Belfontaine, John Risco, and uh, Marcos Levy. Okay, thank you. And then guest. And guests, we also have on our call um, representatives from our our capital repair project. Mm -hmm. We have Nathan Van Zydem. Joe Huberty, uh, John Shales, mm -hmm. and Jason Perkunis. Mm -hmm. And we also have, um, we're joined by Tracy Summer and Patricia Nealon. Mm -hmm. I saw her, for, there she is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, I also see Elizabeth Seeger on the call, okay. as well as Marianne O'Keefe. Okay. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone that we have missed? Thank you. At this time, uh, it's the time for public comment. Is there anyone that would like to address the Board of Trustees at this time? Okay, thank you. Behind, you've got the draft of the minutes from February 16th, 2021. Can we have a motion to adopt the minutes? motion to do so is there a second i'll, I'll second, second. Oh. okay go ahead okay so joan has seconded it is there any discussion regarding the minutes putting no discussion uh stewart has motion joan has seconded it can we have a roll call to approve the minutes from the february 16th meeting mm -hmm. trustee barshas yes trustee fishman yes Trustee Johnson. Yes. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers. Yes. Trustee Wolf. Yes. And Trustee McDonald. Yes. At this time, there are no presentations. We'll turn it over to Trustee Rogers to give the treasurer's report. Okay. Um, February was the beginning of our receipt of property taxes from the bills that were due March 1st. Um, we received $672,000 um, in property taxes. We also earned about $6,200 in general fund interest. Um, we are um, below the expected eight month rate of expenditures. We, that's two thirds of the way through the year and we're just below 60%. Um, there's nothing unusual there. It's simply a matter of timing for when certain uh, expenditures come due. Um, any questions about the um, financial report for February? Mm -hmm. uh, just briefly, uh, you mentioned there's nothing unusual about us shooting at you know, about 6% below expenses, but um, we anticipate being about 6% below expenses by the end of the fiscal year. And we don't anticipate a surge of expenses to match what we anticipated. Is that correct? It is not correct. Um, the bottom line is that the month to month uh, expenses are not uniform from one month to the next. Um, we did not uh, anticipate a surplus in this year's budget. Uh, it's just that expenses are distributed across the year unevenly. And so there's nothing particularly unusual 
about being a few percentage points below or even above what the expenditures are in the budget. Um, we don't budget with a precise month to month expectation. We never know for certain when some revenues are going to be received and we don't know for certain when some of the bills um, and expenditures will occur. So for example, if insurance costs go up, that's simply part of the variation that can occur. Um, the the, the um, Thank you for the answer. What's that? Thank you for the answer. That's news that we're gonna hit 100% of expenses and maybe this year we will for the first time. Well, but we I, don't know whether it's going answer. to be 100%. You budget with the best available information you, at the time that you have to adopt the budget, you don't know what the exact month to month expenses are gonna be, you never do. Um, that's just part of the process. Um, it's a forecast. Um, you know, but there's nothing extraordinary about being at uh, 58 to 60% of, of budgeted amounts uh, at this point during the year. Um, it's uh, it 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 varies from from month to month. Uh, the other item we have under finance uh, is uh, the bills and salaries for February. I move that we approve the bills and salaries, uh, which were in one of the attachments that you had in your board materials. I'll second that. Ron has. Uh... Trustee Rogers has moved and approved the bills and salaries for February 2021. Trustee Wolf has seconded it. Is there any other additional discussion? Farish, can we have a roll call? Trustee Farish, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? Well, despite the treasurer's optimistic projections, it looks to me pretty clearly we're on track for another surplus this year, so I'll vote no. Trustee Riddle, oh, sorry, Trustee Riddle absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. At this time, we've had two uh, capital repair project bid number two go out. And so we're gonna turn it over to Director Austin, as well as uh, Shales McNutt to discuss the two, the next big project of part two. Great, thank you so much here. Let me just get to my page. All right, so um, what we have um, before us this evening is the second bid package. Um, we did discuss this last month as our first phase. The second phase of this project relates to the electrical and general trades. And um, we had a very narrow window of time to review all of our um, bids and to do our scope reviews and everything this time around. Our bids ended on March 5th. Um, but we believe that we've got a great recommendation for you this evening, um, having vetted out our bidders. And um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jason to give us an overview of what this process has been. Jason, are you ready? Yes, sir. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, I think within your board packet, there is the RTA, uh, the bid tabulations, as well as the overall project uh, with bid release one and two uh, budget. So, um, uh, basically, we uh, we uh, we as a team scoped the uh, low electrical bidder, low general trades bidder, um, and determined that they're the lowest qualified bid. Uh, the electrical uh, we did also include uh, IMEG on that discussion just to make sure if there's any questions that came up, any concerns, kind of bounce some ideas, see if they had any questions, comments, concerns, but. Both contractors are uh, ones we've dealt with uh, in the past are uh, definitely qualified and capable of doing this work. Um, we did have uh, also within your board packet is a uh, the, the reef rejection letter, reef, reef contractors rejection letter for bid package uh, 2006A, which is general trades and bid package 26A. Uh, we received a, a extremely low bid upon further review, uh, determined that the contractor was not compliant with prevailing wage requirements of the project. Uh, there were some other inconsistencies as well. Um, so uh, 
it was determined that they they were not the lowest responsible bidder. Uh, so therefore, we uh, uh, pursued uh, scope scoping out the uh, the second bidder for each package. So um, the, overall, uh, great news. Uh, we had two million dollars budgeted for bid release one and two. Uh, we came in uh, about a hundred thousand dollars lower with uh, doing some additional work. We got to accept all the alternates for both bid packages, which is awesome. Uh, we also were able to do some work in the vestibule, some work in the uh, west curtain wall. Uh, they were having some water issues. So there's some other stuff we were able to do even within that that was not originally budgeted for. So just I'm pleased to present this to you, to everyone here. And uh, mm -hmm. if you have any questions, um, let me know. Uh, other problems discovered while they were look, doing a little more in-depth study? How were those problems discovered that you said that we've got? Just curious. Oh, just, uh, yeah, we, there, the vestibule carpet, uh, there was some carpet that was um, at the edges was peeling up. So we, uh, the carpet was pro mm -hmm. probably, that carpet gets a lot of traffic. So that was just a pure aesthetic uh, view of it. The mm -hmm. uh, other uh, uh, vestibule, they were having uh, frequent uh, uh, panels of glass that were breaking. Uh, we actually uh, it, we just put a, a contractor on a TNM and not to exceed basis to actually pull all the caps off, review the substrate. Uh, they actually had to pull every piece of glass, uh, redo the end dams, uh, make sure the weeps are, are uh, operating correctly. So. Uh, there's some intrusive uh, ongoing progress uh, with that, but all that works complete minus they got to put some beauty caps on, which is more of an aesthetic mm -hmm. thing, not a, uh, um, not affecting the system per se. So, yeah. Can you explain exactly where that was or is? Uh, that was on the West vestibule by the, uh, uh, the West vestibule as you, as you walk in the main entry of the building, that right. uh, two-story curtain wall there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. No Any other questions? I move that we select bid packet two for the lowest responsible bidder that pays prevailing wage rates with general trades work for 152,700 and electrical work by high power electric company for 615,500 and bid not to exceed 769,000. Is there a second? I'll second that. Any additional discussion? It's been moved by Lisa McDonald and seconded by Stuart Wolf that we approve bid package two for to exceed $769,000. Can we have a roll call? Mm -hmm. Please. Tr Trustee Barshus, yes. Trustee Fishman. Yes. Trustee Johnson. Yes. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Okay, the next is we're looking forward to hearing uh, Director Austin and Stephen about the upcoming website redesign and uh, what goes mm -hmm. along with it. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Um, so, um, Stephen and I have been working on developing a comprehensive website redesign package since this past December, and uh, we advertised our project for bid on January 19th, and we received um, three bids, as you can see in the cover sheet. Um, after review, we're recommending our low bidder on this project. Um, we're very satisfied with the outcome of uh, their proposal. The proposal in totality is included in your packet. Uh, library Market um, deals exclusively with developing library websites, and uh, they also um, provide an all-inclusive solution to library uh, events through their own uh, master calendar program. Um, so that would, that would be a, a change from what we're currently doing with our calendar management system through another product called Communico. Um, there's a lot of information that we can discuss about this, and we're certainly working on some strategies internally with our own team, with the Website Redesign Committee. And um, I'm happy, along with Stephen, to go through any questions that you have about this project and what our progress has been on the staff side of this project so far. I have a question um, that relates, this is the opposite of what we were looking at 
in the previous set of bids. Um, why is American Eagle more than three times the bid award that's recommended? That's a great question. Um, and comparing the, the products that we saw across the packages, um, I've, I mean, I, I don't want to speak to the quality of the, of, the, of the package. I think they all bid on the exact same um, project. Uh, the, um, the work, I think they just felt um, had a higher value to it. Um, their labor was maybe more involved than the labor that's being proposed by um, Library Market. Um, it is true that one of the, uh, I think, ways that library market is able to keep their overhead a little bit lower is that the transfer of the current content of the website is handled primarily by um, the, the library itself. So um, what, what library market does is they develop templates and they teach us how to develop those templates and um, how to add our own content to them and to audit our own site content. Um, that gives us firsthand experience with how to um, add content to the site and so on and how the CMS works. Um, whereas I think the other vendor probably spends a little bit more time loading that content for us. Although that's, I would speculate that that's the way that it is. It wasn't immediately clear to me if that was how that was gonna lay out. Uh, mm -hmm. But with Library Market, we'll be adding uh, approximately 80 uh, to 90% of the content on our own. It also suggests that the American Eagle budget for advertising drives their costs up. <laughs> <laughs> um, Library Market also deals exclusively with libraries. American Eagle is a more commercial um, vendor. They deal with a lot of other website solutions. Um, other questions about um, yeah. the, the proposal or process? What do you see as the timetable for when the new website will be up? And what input will you be getting beyond staff? Um, so we'll, we'll um, with your approval this evening, we will engage with Library Market and we'll know our time schedule a little bit more um, as we work forward with them and uh, we mobilize. Um, we've already um, been in our interview with, um, with Library Market, they've told us that we're already well ahead of the game in terms of our planning. Um, and I'll let Stephen talk in a moment here about what our committee has been working on um, in terms of our legwork in the, in the, in the interim. Um, but uh, in terms of you know, a deliverable for this project, our goal is to have this up and running this fall. Um, they typically um, allocate um, close to five months for a project of this scope. So I think we're right on target for uh, a release. I mean, we'll target this sometime, say October, November for a, for a final release. Anthony, is this our opportunity to uh, you know, update our domain name? It is, um, and we've been working on that as well. Somebody already owns the domain that we've been chasing. And so we're working with a broker to try to acquire that, that domain name um, to try to make it a little bit easier. Um, Trustee Johnson and I have talked about this before that um, we would like our, our domain to at least have um, an alias of uh, .org. Not everyone is familiar with a .info domain. It's not as easy to communicate to folks. Um, so we're trying to acquire as many of the domains that would be wilmetlibrary.org, com, et cetera, and to have them all essentially mirror to the same site. So we're, we are working on that, yes. Other questions about the, the product that's being proposed or uh, this process in general? Oh, it was good. It was helpful that you directed us to other places that the that, that library market's already done libraries for in the area. So I thought it was good to see the work they've done. That was reassuring. Yeah. So. And did you reach out to them, the other, with their references? Yes, Joan, we did. We, um, we did reach out to several of their existing clients um, and uh, interviewed the staff that were involved in those processes. And that gave us great comfort about um, what the process looks like, what it's like to work with this team. Um, and I have to say across the board, everyone that we spoke with um, had high confidence in the product. And if we asked them, would you do it all over again with library market? And they all emphatically said yes. Um, and that's, you don't always get to hear that type of feedback about a vendor. So we were really mm -hmm. impressed by that. Thank you. Um, Stephen, do you want to give us a little overview of what's been going on on the staff side in the back end? Absolutely. Um, hi, everybody. Hi, um, Steve. I'm the, I'm the digital services manager at the library, and I am in charge of our web redesign committee. Um, we've got a really great committee this go around. 
We've got seven staff members from various departments, various levels of engagement with the library website and varying skill levels. And these are all wholly valuable things when we come into a website redesign. Um, we take all perspectives into account and um, ultimately we're gonna come out with a great result. Um, we've met four or five times so far over the winter. And we started with an evaluation phase, with an inspiration phase. So we took our time to seek out library websites that we thought had great features, great layout, great content, and um, evaluated those. We also took time to evaluate our website as it is. Now we're kind of moving into a consolidation and organization part of um, our current library site evaluation. So. Uh, most recently, we're looking at the library's menu and navigation structure and how we can consolidate, streamline, and ultimately create a improved user experience for our website's visitors. Um, we want um, visitors to find the information they're looking for in the most efficient way. Um, but I can't sing the praises of our committee enough. We've got seasoned veterans on the committee who have direct engagement and stare at it every day, like myself. And we have relatively new staff members um, that have a fresh take. Um, they have more of a user perspective. Um, in addition, um, we've got a great roadmap for moving ahead. Um, not only are we taking the staff input into account, we're developing methods to uh, receive feedback from patrons as well. So. Hmm. We're well underway, and like Anthony said, um, after our meeting with Library Market, it is apparent that we are ahead of the curve. So we're doing great. And we will have an ample opportunity for both staff and the public to, um, to be able to provide feedback as we move forward on progress on the website. So folks will have a chance to um, work with a beta site to give feedback on it before we uh, make our final changes and make those presentations in the fall. So we'll keep you apprised of updates on this as we move forward. Um, but at this point, I think unless you've got any other questions, we'll entertain a motion. Mm -hmm. A motion that we uh, approve going ahead with uh, library market. Um, and um, I, which, what kind of ceiling should I put budget wise on that? Um, 25,000, not too 25,000, okay. That was, that was, I wasn't sure if I should go above that. Okay, thank you. So mm -hmm. a motion that we go ahead with library market and not to exceed a budget of $25,000 at this time. I'll second that. It, okay, it's been moved by Trustee Wolf and seconded by Trustee Gutman that we uh, approve, move forward with the library market, the lowest responsive bidder in an amount not to exceed 25000 Can we have a roll call, please? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Trustee. Trustee Farsis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? I'll vote present uh, to ensure, uh, I'll recuse myself. I heard from a vendor early on, I don't know if they won or not, but uh, to avoid any appearance of conflict, I'm not gonna vote on this one. Okay. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. I do have one suggestion for the minutes. Um, I think you identified Rusty Fishman uh, by a different name. Oh, I'm sorry. I did, Joan. I was... That's a, not a problem. <laughs> Thank you. I get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Just for the record. <laughs> so we don't have anybody looking at the minutes and say, who is that? Mm, right. <laughs> Thank you. I just, I just have one question about uh, something that, that uh, Director Austin brought up um, with about uh, Trustee Johnson. You guys talked about the um, getting the domain names, as you said, for for all the Wilmette Library options that are possible. Do we need at some point to put a like a, a budget or a ceiling cap in place for whatever we have to expend on those on those domain names? Or does that come down the line? I think that's a little bit further down the line. That's a bit okay. cart before the horse at this point. But okay, I did. I did. I don't know if we'd have to act quickly on something, you know, or, or if we'd have a uh, time frame to, to bring it to discussion. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think we'll be fine. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
And now uh, we will go to proceed to look at the fi fi number five financial policy, financial management policy. Uh, we've been looking at the financial policy, their notes going back as far as the fall of 2019. This is an update and we don't know when it was last updated. It went first before the finance committee and then it went before the policy committee. And so what I'd like to do is just do a brief Re preview. Can you hit the PowerPoint or are you sharing with me? Anthony, here we go. Just one second. Let me get the screen share on. Hold on. Okay. There you go. Okay. So it, well, let's go all the way back. That's the end. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, the financial management policy, the finance committee, we've been working on the policy and the board for about one and a half years. The goals were basically to update the policies to reflect Public Library District Act, Public Funds Investment Act, and WPL's actual practices. Two of them, two of the major changes uh, basically was 5-8 detail and details and uh, detail and it's WPL's fund balance and establishes a reserve policy. And one of the reasons we think it's important to uh, establish a reserve balance policy is that it provides direction for the director as well as future boards. Then you've got 5-12, it's a purchasing policy, expenditure not requiring a competitive process, number three and number five for single item purchases of 10,000 of more. It's been increased by $5,000 of purchases that don't need to come before the board for approval, given that the board has already approved the board budget for which the money will be spent. And a lot of times I think most of those purchases were probably uh, furniture. And in the past people might have split it up so that it was under the uh, $5,000 limit, but I think this will add more transparency to it. And then if we look at, basically we wanna talk a lot about, I think the big discussion has been is what should the reserve balance policy be? And so that's what probably the most of the discussion is gonna occur with the board. I would just like to look as of, this is in a packet, 22821, our general fund balance was $8,902,000. And what we're proposing is a one year reserve, which would bring it down to roughly 6 million. We have three areas where we can't touch. They're the retirement, the auditor, and the insurance, liability, audit, and IMRF. Then you've got a special reserve balance of five as of February, the end of February. 5.95 in basically five six million dollars of that one million eight hundred and eighty two thousand has been committed through the fall for the bid packets that we've approved last month and this month and if we look at it we need a total in terms of re, uh, repairs of 7.8 million for ordinary repairs through in 20 years based on that capital reserve study, we also have $183,147 in the Rutherford Trust, which is for basically programs for travel and is also restricted. So if we look at basically what would happen, what has happened in the past is once we got the auditor's report, whatever money was in the general fund balance, we would put some money into the special reserve fund balance after we had gotten the auditor's report, usually in the fall. It hadn't been done the last two years. And there really wasn't any policy as to what should be our general fund balance. So if we flip to the page, how much reserve should WPL maintain? What we're recommending, what some of us have recommended, the two policies, uh, two committees, that we retain a, a balance in the unrestricted general operating fund equal to an amount needed to continue library operations for a period of one year. 
If we look at what other libraries have, Niles has a policy of at least six months. Palatine has at least six months. Winneka, no less than six months, up to 12 months. Fountaindale Public Library, no less than district, no less than three months and no more than 10 months. And Indian Trails Library District, no less than three months and no more than 12 months. And quite a few libraries have no reserve policy as we did. So I'm just opening it up for discussion. And I guess the reason why I think it's important to have it. And uh, Ron sent out, uh, Trustee Rogers sent out an email detailing some of the information in terms of some of the special emergencies that we've had. But I think the rationale is to provide financial stability, cash flow for operations, adequate reserves to respond to emergencies. We had COVID. Luckily, we, a lot didn't happen. But if you look at what happened this year, Cook County taxes, the due date for the first installment with no uh, late payment of interest was extended to May 3rd, 2021. Also, if we look at the 2020 capital needs study, it only addresses routine maintenance. It's excluded where computers, technology, and the current RFID project and needs identified by the next long range plan, which we haven't planned, but will be happening sometime in the next two years when things settle down. So I'm just opening it up for discussion. I support a 12 month. If I look at how I run my household, I'd be in trouble if I didn't have emergency reserves of 12 months. But opening it up for discussion and let's go. Well, I'll go first and I want to thank you, Madam President, uh, for the work. It's long overdue that we have a policy and I uh, appreciate the sort of spirit of open discussion that you're you know, planting the flag around. So um, I appreciate that. Um, you know, here's my way of thinking, uh, which probably isn't a surprise to anybody on the board, but um, you know, we have an overwhelming amount of money in the bank. And I think it's great that we're trying to address that we clearly have a fund balance, which is too high um, and we need to right size it. Um, we had some, uh, I, I did, I'll sort of reiterate the, the learnings I had when I interacted with uh, Director Austin on this. So I asked like, you know, is this, what's the purpose of this, right? When will we need five or $6 million extra in the bank? Do we need it because we need money in the bank to pay the bills before the property tax uh, money comes in? The answer is no, that's not why we need it. So do we need it for our capital expenses? Well, no, we've got 6 million in the bank. Uh, we're gonna spend two, which is great. And we've got 20 years to spend the other four. And I thought uh, all we needed was six. I didn't think we need seven, but you know, whichever. Um, if there's an emergency and we need to tap some money, can we tap that capital fund, that extra 4 million we're gonna have for the next 10 or 15 or 20 years? The answer is yes, we can. And so what is the risk that we're trying to mitigate against by sitting on our neighbors six or $7 million? And uh, to me, every year we can levy, you know, whatever we want within the tax cap. So, and we've been over levying in my, you know, estimation because we generate a surplus. So there isn't a value to sitting on $6 million of taxpayer money in perpetuity because there isn't really an emergency or a scenario in which we're going to spend it. So uh, to me, I'd suggest maybe if we didn't have the capital fund, if we didn't have an extra $4 million in the bank, then maybe we'd want a million or $2 million cushion just in case. But we have a cushion, we'll have it for 20 years. And so I don't think we need any uh, reserve fund because we already have a capital reserve fund. And as long as we're in, in all the emergencies we think about, COVID or you know a car hitting our front door, which happened, well, either insurance covers it or we end up spending less, not more. So ultimately, we would only need to sit on $6 million of our neighbor's money because we need to spend more than we tax. And we are kind of in the opposite problem. We're taxing more than we spend. So um, again, I really do appreciate it, Lisa. I think it's great to have the conversation publicly and transparently. Uh, I, I'm grateful for it. Uh, but I come down on um, $6 million is way too much money because there just isn't 
a specific purpose. I'm open to hear a specific scenario where in two years, this thing happens where we need to spend $2 million or $4 million, but I, I haven't heard anything close to it. And our problem is the opposite, that we're, we're taxing a little bit more than we need rather than we, you know, we've got too much money in the bank today. So anyway, I appreciate it. Thanks again. I disagree that we're taxing too much. If you look at it for two years, it was flat. And the last two years, 1920, it was zero increase in terms of the levy. Most budgets have come in under four to 2%. I would not say that that's over budgeting because I think we've slowly taken it down. And those are my thoughts there. In terms of uh, what you need the money for, you had proposed the three month, I think at one point in time. And I don't, and uh, I think that is far too low, but I'm letting it, opening it up to others. What do others think? But first I'd like to, Anthony, Director Austin had said, we never asked him what his thoughts were on it. And since he's the director that is at the helm, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are, Director Austin. Thank you. Um, just, yeah, I, I appreciate the spirit of this conversation and I'm glad that we've got a policy up on the table here and I'm looking forward to, to us having a formal policy. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity. Um, there are times where tax disbursements have not come on time. And that would, that's definitely what we need to guard against. Our tax, our tax disbursements happen twice a year. So if there, were a if there were a delay, and in my previous organization where we did not have a reserve fund, that was flush, that was Palatine. Um, they just won a successful re referendum to give them the adequate funding that they need to operate. Uh, but there was a time when there was a late disbursement of taxes and I was mortified that I wouldn't be able to make payroll, um, that I would have to figure out what I was going to do with my employees if I couldn't pay all of my bills. Um, if we can't approve the bills each month, uh, my staff doesn't get paid. They don't get insurance. Um, things that uh, our, our books and everything that we're ordering to serve the public are not able to be fulfilled. We can't keep the lights on. Um, so I think, you know, at least having six months of reserve is a safe is a safeguard for us in the event that if tax payments were not to be received, we would at least be able to rely on that. Then I think any degree of overage that there might be on top of that um, would guard against any other risks that we would have. Um, those would be the unpreventable things, uh, those acts of God, those things that, we, that Dan was talking about before um, that were in Ron's document. Um, that would be you know, when someone crashes into the building, um, any of those unforeseen types of events. So I think it is reasonable for us to put a ceiling on our, on our fund balance. I think that's the first and most responsible thing for us to do is to, do, is to put a cap on it and say, look, we need to, we need to put a cap on this. Uh, the other piece I need to, to, to reiterate is that um, the Capital Reserve study indicated that we need approximately $8 million to sustain um, and maintain and, and repair the facility over the course of the next 20 years. So we have $8 million worth of our special reserve of, of all of our reserve funds uh, that have been encumbered for the next 20 years. Um, so really what we're looking at is trying to even out uh, the money that we have allocated in reserve. They're kind of inverted right now where we have 6 million in special reserve and 8 million in the general fund. If you flip that around, uh, that looks a little bit better. Um, the money that goes into, into the special reserve fund can only be used for those capital projects that they're eligible for um, as defined in the act. So um, if someone were to crash into the building, you know, that, those types of events, um, those are unforeseen. They're things that you can't anticipate. Uh, it's the reason why we would appropriate a little bit more each year would be to cover any of those unforeseen expenses. Um, so I think it is wise for us to have a, um, at least six months in reserve. Um, just from an operations standpoint, from where I sit, that would give me a bit more comfort in, in ensuring that I can continue to sustain operations of the library. And then I think putting a threshold on it at some point above that six months um, would be the most prudent approach um, from an operational standpoint from where I sit. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. Others? Illinois does have a provision that would allow us to meet such expenses without a reserve. It's, it's called selling tax anticipation warrants. It costs money to do so because you pay interest. It's a loan. Um, we do not have any history of needing to sell tax anticipation warrants, but we have had in the past 
periods of time when either because of the complexity of reassessments or because of other matters that we have no direct control over, um, our real estate tax payments have been delayed for several months. That hasn't been true in the last few years. That's no guarantee that it couldn't happen again. So in order for us not to have to borrow money and pay the costs of doing so, the reserve fund gives us additional security to be able to manage those. There's another factor which ha is not in the um, capital needs study and it wasn't intended to be, that wasn't their role. We are about to engage in another long range planning process. In the long range planning process, we asked residents and staff to forecast what library services should look like in the coming period of years. And in past long range planning studies, we have had recommendations emerge that led to changes in the building, where, where particular parts of the collection are located. So for example, a number of years ago, we moved the youth services collection from the first floor to the second floor. There are other changes that might result from the um, shifts that are currently continuing with respect to greater use of digital and online uh, resources. Uh, we don't know what the next long range plan is going to recommend, but it's possible that in the future, more capital needs would be uh, incurred in order to meet the recommendations that emerge from our next long range plan. Long range planning in, our, in, in the Wilmette Library District has among other things resulted in a significant expansion of the building, um, which did not, we didn't have reserve funds to support that. We had a, a bond referendum. Uh, we paid off those bonds in 2006. And since then the library has had no debt. Uh, management of our reserve funds has enabled us to maintain the high quality of services that we now have um, without having to conduct referenda, that's another expense, and without having to borrow money to meet uh, expenses when tax receipts are delayed or when other problems occur. So it's, a, it's an insurance policy. It's a way of our anticipating future needs and requests um, and being prepared to handle them. Um, the, the, um, the library board has over the last several years, as Lisa mentioned, not increased our levies. We haven't had an increase in our levy in about six years. Uh, I'm not suggesting that we need to, but our tax rate limitation is 5% and we're currently at about three and a half percent. Um, we're in a, a solid financial position because the past boards have very carefully managed these resources and kept them in reserve to meet future long range plans, future capital needs and other changes that might be appropriate to maintain the high quality of services that Wilmette residents expect from their library. So it's, it's sound financial management practice. What this proposed policy does is it realigns our past practices with the financial management policies. But there's one additional element that I would like to suggest, and that is um, it's also been suggested that we um, engage a consultant to look forward at the financial management practices and future expectations of the board um, 
with, by hiring a consultant who can assist with that process. We have done that in the past as a board, though not recently. And you know that's a process that would take several months. In the meantime, I think it's a step forward to adopt the policy that's been recommended by the Finance Committee and the Policy Committee and to uh, request that the director begin the process of looking at who might be available to assist in conducting that review of future financial needs, not just capital needs, but looking broadly. And those recommendations might come back to us and suggest some changes that we have not yet made. But the bottom line is that we need to update the financial management policies over what we previously had. And the next step would be a financial management um, study looking at not just capital needs, but all of the requirements looking over the next two, a few decades. Anyone else from the board? Okay. I, I was just going to say, I see it that having the reserve, I, I, I gave the analogy, and it's very simplistic, but every time you take your car in, you think it's just going to be something very basic. And lo and behold, it's much more involved. And I see that actually, even with our long term uh, review, our capital study, that the once they get in, there's always something else. And it adds up. And so having uh, that cushion, I think, even over looking at that we have the 8 million over the 20, possibly over the 20 years, sooner or later, that's going to be more than we anticipate. And um, I would say having that reserve is, um, is necessary. So, and I also appreciated Ron, thank you very much once again for your write up. Um, I think it was very useful and, and it's an ongoing reference for us. So thank you very much. What? I move that we approve the financial management policy. I'll second that. Uh, Lisa, you're muted. I keep cutting me off. It's been moved by Trustee Rogers and seconded by uh, Trustee Wolf that we approve the financial management policy number five. Any other discussion? I guess just for the record, um, I appreciate Anthony's point that maybe sometime in the future, the county won't levy a property tax for us and there may be some sort of major government breakdown um and hey anything's possible um not bloody likely but i guess anything's possible but i think ron's other point is well taken that there's lots of ways for governments to get money in the future right we can always float a bond and ask the people for it if we want to raise taxes beyond our five percent you know we can always ask the people for more and i think uh, there's, there's a, it, it's a little, arrogance, not the word, but, but it's a little forward ish to say, we are going to hold on to upwards of $14 million in the bank over the next 20 years, rather than putting that, uh, you know, decisions up to the future boards. That's it's just too much money. But I appreciate, again, Lisa, I really do appreciate the open conversation that you've shepherded to the board on what I think is probably the, the biggest policy decision we make. So thanks again. Okay, thank you, Trustee Johnson. It's been moved, seconded. Any other discussion? I, I would only add the issue that uh, is surrounding all this too, is that emergencies are emergencies and you can't plan for them and you can't put money aside for them. So we're lucky to have 
the money we have in case of emergencies that we don't have to go out and ask people for more. And I just like to add one more thing on top of what uh, Trustee Barsh just said. You know, the, the this has been an issue we've spent a lot of time on, deservedly so. Um, but but to keep in mind that um, again, by Illinois law, we can't we can't we can't negative levy. We can't lower if we lower our levy three years in a row, we then all of a sudden lower our ceiling for what we can levy going forward. And and so we would then be handicapping the library's ability to financially function uh, and be starting running at a deficit. Um, and that I think would be much more um, would be very unpalatable for the community, the extended community. Number one, number two, we have this money, and as Trustee Rogers pointed out, we have not raised the levy. Uh, when I was head of the finance committee, and then Trustee Rogers now, and he before me, you know, we were we were always trying to be conservative in terms of what we were doing, and we have not raised the levy um, these last several years, and we have no intention of of having to do so, nor need to do so. Um, but that money, we can't make that money magically go away. It can't be, there's no mechanism to give it back to the community. So our choices are kind of limited. I mean, it's good to have these conversations, make sure we're as transparent as possible, but understand that uh, we, we need to be as responsible as we can as a board in terms of how we use that money. And as Trustee Barsh just said, it's great to have, and, and I like the analogy actually that um, that uh, Trustee Fishman said about the car, that you, you, there's no question that we, we do things in the library that end up costing more money than we anticipate. Um, yes, is the, is the money on paper look a little too large? But over time, we are gonna be as a board now, and as for future boards being responsible, both for the new policy um, and through what we have learned in this whole process um, to, to manage this money well on behalf of the library, on the half of, behalf of the community, which we have also, again, there have been extraordinary circumstances the last couple of years that have also impacted um, uh, our, our circumstances as well. So, so that's the thing to keep in mind. It's not like we can magically click our, clip our fingers and give money back to people, rebate money on their, you know, on their tax bills. It doesn't work that way, unfortunately. Um, and so the best we can do is, is keep planning and using the money, not, not because the money's there, but using it, and again, in the way that's most impactful for the uh, library to serve the community and to be most responsible to the community and the library in terms of how we uh, do that going forward. Thank you. Anybody else? I have one more thing that we never, we talk about and then we talk, don't talk about is once again, parking. <laughs> and um, Ron? <laughs> can we, can we, can we? Make I, I don't want to open up. Okay, but I'm just saying, someday we will be happy we have the money for parking. I hope well, you're right. <laughs> we hope you're right, <laughs> Trusty Fishman. Uh, just last you. Last one on that, just as a matter of law, you know, Trustee Wolf's incorrect. Governments can do a one-time rebate whenever they'd like. We there's have that authority. No, but there's and no mechanism. There, there is a, there, there's plenty of ways that if the board wishes to rebate money without undercutting the three-year running average of the property tax, there's plenty of ways that any government can rebate excess money that they've developed over time. So it's not like we're it's not like we're legally incapable of rebating the money. I think the board's making a policy decision that the majority of the board would prefer to keep it. But if we wanted to legally, we could certainly rebate any amount of this money that we'd like to without well, impacting Okay, disagree. enough. I respectfully disagree with that. I, my, okay. my opinion, we don't have okay. that. Okay, excuse me. Thank you. It's been moved. It's been seconded. We've had the discussion. Can we have a roll call to approve a financial policy? Number five. Okay. Trustee Barshis, yes. Trustee Fishman? Yes. Trustee Johnson? No. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. And Trustee McDonald? Yes. Thank you. And thank you for the spirit of the discussion. Mm -hmm. two, two things I'd like to suggest. One is that um, uh, the director could <coughs> proceed with um investigating how we would conduct a um a policy you know a cons or enter into a consulting agreement for someone to assist with looking at the financial picture of the library moving forward uh one other thing which i think is historically um important to recognize um Prior to the tax cap, we levied exactly what we needed, uh, and we did not have the need 
to look as far ahead as we do now. The tax cap as it operates automatically erodes the tax rate, the operating fund tax rate. That is part of the reason why, although we have approval from residents to levy up to 5%, we're currently at 3.5%. It is not necessarily the case that absent the tax cap, we have the same options available to us that we might have had in, in the years that preceded the tax cap. I'm the only member of this board who served under both of those conditions. And um, I don't think that it's a realistic picture to say that we should operate as if there were no tax cap. And so that's part of what this financial planning um, consulting agreement might assist us in the putting into perspective. And that doesn't require any board action at this time, but I do recommend that we ask the director to explore uh, how we might proceed on that path. Okay, thank you for your suggestion, Kim. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Let's hold off till the fall for him to do that since we've got a new accounting firm that'll be operating and you've got a whole bunch of projects that don't culminate till September in terms of what's going on. Okay, updated. It's your turn, Director Austin. All right, thank you all. Um, so the, the, um, the next item on the agenda is discussion of our pandemic response plan. Um, as you know, the library reopened on Friday, February 19th, and that day remains our busiest day of foot traffic since we've reopened. Um, we've been reopened now for about a month. On that first day, uh, F February 19th, we had 508 people who visited the library during the eight hours that we were open. So we averaged about 64 patrons each hour. Um, by comparison, that same day in 2020, so pre-pandemic, we had an average day um, with 894 people visiting the library over the course of 12 hours, and that was an average of about 74 patrons an hour, so just 10 more patrons an hour um, now. Overall, our door counts this past month have averaged about 371 patrons each day, or 46 patrons per hour. So we're busy. Um, we've got a lot of folks coming through the library. In February 2020, our circulation averaged about 2,100 items per service day. And in February 21, our circulation averaged 1,800 items per service day. So as you can see, we're at about 87% of our normal daily circulation, which is comparatively high to the reported statistics that I'm hearing across all of our peer libraries. And that is consistent with the data that we've been, that we've been sharing with you to date and with uh, the information that was shared with you this January when we were nominated as a five-star library according to the Library Journal based upon our statistical measures. So it's busy. Um, we've got a lot going on in, inside the building. Um, and I think that since we've reopened, um, patrons are, are continuing to use parking lot pickup. However, our appointments have dropped off sharply um, uh, since the building is reopened and patrons are taking advantage of the self-service. So we're averaging about 20 appointments per day um, while we're pushing the same volume each hour that we did November through early February. So it's, a, it's still a very busy uh, operation for us and most of our patrons are preferring to come inside the building now to collect their materials. Um, overall, in terms of uh, patron compliance with our health and safety guidelines, everyone has really been consistently favorable in complying with our guidelines. And overall, the patron feedback that staff have been receiving at all of our points of service and to me directly um, have been very positive. Um, as I said before, um, our, our, uh, our our services during this phase are very similar to what we have offered um, during the previous open phase. That was July through November. Um, we're still not offering study rooms. Um, our seating areas and work tables are, are limited. We're not offering room rentals. The periodicals room remains closed, although we're offering magazines to folks and they remain holdable. Um, we're not offering in-person programming. 
Um, we do have quite a number of virtual programs going on. In fact, probably more programming than we've ever done before. Um, there are some challenges ahead of us there, obviously, as we start to see more vaccinations moving forward and having to develop hybrid programming. And that is certainly something that the leadership team and I are discussing. Um, we're still not allowing eating and drinking inside the library. And uh, the friends in the library are not accepting material donations. And of course, the friends and our volunteers um, are, uh, are, are currently not working with the library, although I, I do anticipate that that will change at some point here in the near future. Um, so that's just kind of a brief summary of where we've been this past month in terms of our uh, response plan. Uh, do any of you have any questions um, or comments about uh, what our service model is at this moment? Okay, if none, then I will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is an update on our projects. Um, so today we saw installation um, of three new self-checkout stations. Uh, these were stations that we um, received actually a couple weeks ago, but they gave us the wrong library stations. And we were really stumbling with our installation crew with trying to get those things up and running because they weren't intended for us they sent us the wrong ones. So we got the right ones. They came in today and they are up and running. Um, so um, in terms of the RFID project itself- Wait, 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 wait. How long did it take, how long until you figured that out or they told you like, sorry, did they made you run around for like a day until they were like, our bad? It was, it was a couple hours that day, the installation tech was having some challenges and, and then we realized that there was probably a hiccup there, so. Did they send us a gift card or something? <laughs> um, I, I think, I think there have been a couple hiccups on this project that um, I think they're gonna give us something here at the end of it. So I, I can't commit to that um, on this call, but um, I do think that that Biblioteca wants to do right by us, so. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, so the self-checkouts have been really popular. Um, for any of you who have been in the building and have checked out with us since we've been reopened, um, you've seen a few of those around the building. There are gonna be three more that are available now. Um, the kids love them. Um, I love them too. And I love using my app with it. If I forget my library card and I'm up in my office, I tend to leave my wallet behind. I've always got my phone on me and I can just pull up my library card there and, and check things out. So that's, it's very convenient. We've gotten good feedback on that. And there's a lot of good um, features that are available on those self-checkout machines that we haven't even enabled yet uh, that we have the ability to develop here over the course of, um, of the summer. Um, as far as the RFID project goes, which is the key reason why we're doing all of this, um, that team has been doing a fabulous job. Um, so they've essentially done all of the print material on the first floor of the library. So that is, everything that's in the popular recent arrivals area, the hot picks, the book club hub, our large type collection, the teen area, the fiction room, all of the 400s and our English language, English, lang English, I can't even speak English, our English language materials. Um, and we have moved on to the second floor. Um, so uh, we're, we're making great progress moving across um, that collection. Um, I understand that we're working on the easy readers at the moment. Um, so we're kind of working across that we've done all the picture books and uh, the holiday materials. So um, we've got crews working on tagging um, 12 hours a day from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. We've got three tagging stations that are up and uh, all new materials that, are, that we're receiving are being RFID tagged in the technical services department before they go down for circulation as well. So um, we're really moving along really quickly. Um, we are a little bit behind on this project because we received the equipment late. Um, as you know, we're, we're probably about six to eight weeks behind what the schedule was that I had established for this project. Um, we're not behind schedule though, as far as what the staff's actual labor is on the project. Um, it's just, it was just that delay at the outset that's kind of set us back a little bit. I do anticipate that this project will be completed um, probably by the end of April. And um, we'll continue to give, give you updates as we move forward on that process. Um, a number of changes have taken place as a result of this. And um, if you have been in the building, you will notice that some collections have moved around. I reported on a lot of those this last month, um, but uh, the audiovisual collections will definitely need um, some more attention as we work towards those. That's the last collection that we're gonna work with. They're a little bit more complicated to manage with the tagging. So um, I think you can expect to see some other changes there 
um, soon. Um, but that's all that I have to say about RFID today. Do you have any questions or comments about this project? Okay. Um, then um, that's all I have is updates on projects at this point. Um, in the future, I'll use this portion to talk about our progress on our website development. Um, and obviously that with your approval this evening, we're very much excited to get that underway. So I will uh, bring that contract forward for review and approval. And um, we will engage with Library Market and move forward there. The staff is going to continue working on their side of this process, and we will move towards our target of getting the new website up and running uh, by this fall. Um, is there anything else um, either related to the pandemic or the library projects that you want to talk about before I get into the director's report? Mm -hmm. All right, seeing none, um, I will try to sail through uh, my report for you and get to any uh, specific questions that you may have. Um, so uh, March saw the, the close of our winter reading program. Um, and thanks to the support of the Friends of the Library, we were able to offer our first ever virtual um, winter reading uh, club program. Um, adults were invited to read four books in any genre and kids and teens were encouraged to read or to be read to for 20 days in a row. Participants of all ages who completed those goals um, received a $15 gift certificate to the book stall to choose a book of their choosing. Um, and we had 154 adults who completed the challenge, 240 children uh, uh, through grade eight uh, completed and 17 teens. So um, we had a good turnout and um, we're hoping that we can uh, continue to improve uh, those numbers over the course of the next year. We saw, we saw certainly more adult participation here than we have in, the, in years past. Winter Reading Club has historically been a more children oriented program um, and we're seeing more adults and teens taking advantage of it. So I wanna thank the friends again for, for their generous sponsorship of the program. Um, and um, speaking of the Friends, uh, the Friends are also sponsoring a couple events that are coming up for us. So um, one of them is next week, next Thursday, March 25th. We will be joined by um, Harlan Coben, um, very big name author. We're excited to host Harlan Coben and we're doing this in partnership with a few other libraries. So Aurora, Glencoe, Highland Park, Lake Villa, Northbrook, and Vernon area libraries have all partnered with us to host Harlan Coben next Thursday night at 7 p.m. There's information about that on the website. Um, definitely check that out. Um, going back to February, um, we had another author event. On February 18th, local resident Catherine Grace Katz uh, discussed her book, The Daughters of Yalta, with us via Zoom. We had 280 participants, um, or, well, screens, so I don't know, there are probably some families that were gathered around their computers as well, but at least 282 people participated in that program with us, and we've had a lot of great uh, feedback from that specific event and interest in her book. Um, so we're really excited at just how much our community has taken to the virtualization of our author programs, um, and we've been able to offer many more than we've been able to do in the past. So um, we're going to continue to study that as a, as a uh, service option for us going forward. Um, in my training section of the report, I shared with you that um, we had a safety training program on February 27th, where 14 of our staff members participated in that. Um, it was offered to our entire um, security and safety team, as well as our facilities staff and our managers on the first floor of the library. Um, it was a really outstanding event and we're gonna be developing a number of those training uh, sessions, the data that we've collected from that training session and share it across the entire team at our future staff development day, as well as through our person in charge program, which is our leadership team and professional staff that participates in that. Um, so I wanted to share more about that. Um, I want to remind everyone that the library is partnering with the League of Women Voters for candidate forums. We hosted one this last Saturday, and uh, we're hosting another one with our trustee candidates this coming Saturday, um, March 20th. And um, information about, about that is on our website as well as on the League's page. Um, it is free to attend, but you need to register to get the link. Um, and then the last item I wanted to share with you is that we are now officially kicking off our One Book Everyone Reads series. This again is a program sponsored generously by the Friends of the Library. You can learn all about it on our website. It's right there on the front page. 
our book this year is Interior Chinatown, which is the 2020 National Book Award winner for fiction. And we will be hosting author Charles Yu on Wednesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. I did have a misprint on the first draft of our agenda that said that it was Saturday. That was a holdover from a previous um, board report, but it, um, all of the dates that you find everywhere else, citing Wednesday, April 14th at 7 p.m. is the exact date of that program as planned. We're gonna be doing three book discussions and we have seven supporting programs, including um, some highlights that I think are really interesting. We're hosting an event on um, anti-Asian racism, xenophobia and COVID-19 next Wednesday, March 24th. We're hosting our first Mandarin English bilingual story time on Saturday the 27th. And we're having a Mandarin conversation cafe on Friday, April 2nd. Uh, where you can connect with others in the community who are learning to speak Mandarin Chinese. Uh, we've got a local teacher that's going to teach folks who even have no um, Mandarin skills to learn basic words and phrases, and everyone is invited to attend. Um, so I will pause there. Does anyone have any questions or comments about the content of the director's report or anything that I've just spoken on? <laughs> I was just going to say, um, I so appreciate the uh, Friends of the Library, and I think that program is a uh, winter book group, uh, reading group club is popular because I think that's very generous at the, um, for the gift card at the bookstall. So I, I participated in that. I also um, was part of the Daughters of Yalta um, program, and that was excellent. So I really enjoyed that. Um, and I've used the um, self-checkout. So <laughs> I agree, it's fun and it's easy. So thank you. All right, thank you. Anyone else? I'll just say that I'm delighted with everything that uh, has been offered during this time. You've done a wonderful job of putting together diverse programs for everybody to find something that they would like and uh, that's been marvelous at this time. Thank you. We've got an amazing staff, very creative and uh, incredibly resilient. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, well, that concludes my report then. Thank you all. Uh, Lisa, Do you have you're... a report from the ILA? Mm -hmm. Just uh, real quickly, a couple of things. The uh, uh, registration is open for the Looking Forward Conference, uh, which will be May 7th, 2021. Um, they're talking mostly about talking, actually, and uh, a core understanding of value and the impact of language and how we use it to be there to be inclusive in our library uh, spaces. There are also trustee forums if you're interested, spring workshops uh, coming up in March, April, and May. You can check on the ILA website. And uh, in April and May, they have noon network webinars that talk about individual topics like intellectual freedom, inclusiv inclusivity, uh, providing diverse materials and Rainbow Book Month. So take a look if you're interested. Uh, the noon is just an hour uh, out of the day. Okay. Director That's Austin, it. thank you. Mm -hmm. Director Austin, do you have anything to add regarding ILA or Rails? Um, nothing at this time. Um, I would just say to, to consult the COVID Pulse page on Rails for any updates related to um, our library or our peer library's response to the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then in terms of communication, have there been any suggestions from the suggestion box or? Um, I don't have any at this time, so no. Thank you. And mm -hmm. um, it's been stated, three seats on the seven member WPL Board of Trustees will be on the local ballot for Tuesday. Mm -hmm. April 6, we have two incumbents and it's six candidates for three seats and as uh, Director Austin has said, the league will be sponsoring, I think it's nine o'clock, it's nine o'clock this Saturday. Yep. Mm -hmm. for, 
for the candidate. So mm -hmm. it's a good chance, time to see what everybody is thinking. And in the interim, if you don't want to do that, you can go to the league's website and see their positions. And I'll add that um, a recording is also made of those. So if you're not able to attend that that program, you can view the video afterwards. Okay. Ron and I do that. <laughs> afterwards. And, yeah. We've already gone over one book, Everyone Reads, which is exciting. Any new business, the only new business we've got is that there will be a policy committee meeting on uh, April 5th at four o'clock to go over operate the operations policy. Any other new business? Any old business? No. Thank you, everyone. And is there a motion to adjourn? A motion to so adjourn. moved. Okay. So <laughs> Trustee Wolf has motions. Trustee Johnson has seconded. It's been moved and seconded. Can we have a roll call? Since I think with the new, I just rent to the Open Meetings Act uh, class. We need to do a roll call when we're virtual. Okay. So. Trustee Barshas, yes. Trustee Fishman. I'm not hearing. I'm you. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry. Okay. Trustee Johnson? Yes. Trustee Riddle, absent. Trustee Rogers? Yes. Trustee Wolf? Yes. Trustee McDonald? Yes. The meeting adjourned at 7.18 p.m. Thank you. Lisa, is that what we your virtual event? We should be doing a roll call or just for, just for adjourning and for? Every motion, anything should be voted. It needs a roll call because we're virtual. I, I had to do the Open Meetings Act training for something else this past week and every um, roll call because of being virtual you can't see who's i and i so you've got it on uh, record uh, okay thank you okay i can just say thank you to all our visitors we're yeah. glad you came yes. yeah tracy patricia glad you guys are running and and uh yeah, yeah. and marianne too i didn't sorry marianne, i didn't mean to miss you but you're in front of my screen <laughs> so yeah Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks.